Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Symposium. Isn't this fall weather so much fun? You know, I think uh, a couple of nights ago, it's like, I actually had to get a blanket. And for a woman my age, it's like unheard of to have to do that. Okay. If I can remind you, please, to put your phones off or on the silent mode. Guess what happens next weekend? Time change, right. So you're welcome, of course, to get here at 930. If you so desire, we'll be here, but our speaker won't. So <laughs> many times we've seen people come in a little early and then in the spring, they're a little late. Um, so this is a little off with the daylight savings time. I, if I'm, I, when I was a kid, I kind of remember it was always dark for Halloween. The daylight savings time hit before that, but pretty soon we probably won't have it. Do we have any Oakmont Sunday announcements? Jeff? The movie this afternoon will be Journal for Jordan and One Week Countdown to Top Gun Maverick. So I guess you better get here early for that one. Jeff, you were standing room only for CODA, right? When you did CODA? Yeah, so if you want to see Top Gun, you might want to get here. Not at two o'clock, but at like 1.59, 1.58, okay? Something like that, get there early. I'd like to make an announcement for Sue Correll. That's Sue's usually out here collecting money with Kathy back there. And she is today at noon hosting um, Sarah Emenzadeh. Is that how we say her name? Um, she is running for assembly. And if you would like to meet her, Sue's address is 7381. Oakleaf Drive. Easier way to remember it is just go right down Valley Lakes and we're at Tees. That's where her house is. You'll see all the cars out there. Okay. Next week's speaker is Phil Barber. Um, this is a really interesting one. This is uh, Japanese Americans were legal and loyal. So why were they sent away? So this talks about the Japanese internment camps. I want to remind you for question and answer, we'll be running two mics. And you know what? The mics are on. You don't have to worry about it. If you have a question, the mic is on. You don't need to play with any of the buttons on there because we'll have a hard time getting it on again. Okay, perfect. And then if I have anything else here, that's what I have. And I get to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker was brought on by Rita Archibald, who is on our speaker committee, and she is unable to make it this morning, but we want to welcome Rita back and hope she feels better. Now, Brad Olson, you might have seen him when he was sitting back in the back earlier today. He is a captivating speaker and author of 10 books. 10. He's an award winning author, book publisher, and an event producer. He's in high demand for his keynote presentations throughout the United States in person, on radio, and on TV. And probably, are you podcasting or doing anything like that coming up? Soon podcast. He's traveled to all seven continents, including Antarctica by sailboat, seeking adventure and the answers to the mysteries of humankind's past. Bad Olson is known for his critically acclaimed Sacred Places, 108 Destinations, uh, the first book in the series of Sacred Places, North America. And they're back there, aren't they, Brad? He has them in the back for you if you're interested. Uh, Sacred Places North America was released as a second, second edition in April 2008 to rave reviews and a gold award for best travel book of the year. Brad appeared on the History Channel show, America Unearthed. Okay, wait a minute, there, there's more. Brad is also <laughs> the author and illustrator of Extreme Adventure series of adrenaline pumping guidebooks Extreme Adventures Hawaii and Extreme Adventures Northern California. Brad's commentaries have appeared on Coast to Coast AM, National Public Radio, CNN, The X Zone, Buzzsaw, and the Travel Channel, among other outlets. Now, besides that, Brad enjoys public speaking on travel to sacred places, the mystery of esoteric subjects, and the extended global explorations. After his talks, his books will be on sale on the table in the back. And Brad will be there to talk to you also after the presentation. And I am so honored to present to you Brad Olson. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. 
Does it sound okay? Not too loud? Okay. Well, it's good to be back here in the Valley of the Moon. I'm a big fan of our native son here who uh, wrote the book, The Call of the Wild. You call and we get wild. Is that what he means? No. Uh, traveling is what he meant. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to take a tour across North America, but I'm going to first start by going way back. And I think this is important because we have to know who we are in this continent to know how we got here. And I think that'll become a lot clearer as we go through this. Now I got a little message here. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a talk that I gave, boy, at least 50 times in the lead up to uh, my esoteric series of books, which is what I'm in demand for these days. But one thing that I talk about, even when I do my uh, Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica talk, which was just uh, last weekend in Orlando, Florida, even though I'm from California here, flew out there to 900 people, huge audience, and uh, everybody's interested in Antarctica. And me being a map guy, I'm a cartographer myself. It's been in uh, several of my books that I draw myself. And just, I love maps. Isn't it interesting how we say we read a map? We read the lines, but it's really more of an illustration than anything. But if we were able to read this map from Turkey by an admiral named Piri Reis, who drew this map in 1513. That's just 21 years before Columbus's voyage. And on the liner notes, it says that it is drawn from source maps dating all the way back to the Library of Alexandria. So cartography during the age of exploration was one of the most valuable sources of information. How can you know where you're going without a map? So copying maps and doing cartography with what new information you have is so vitally important. So 21 years before Columbus reached the Caribbean. Now, when this map was drawn, they didn't have the Mercator scale, and that's basically creating a map three-dimensionally in a, in a globe or sphere. And <clears throat> I've had debates with flat earthers. And it's like, I've been to Antarctica, man. <laughs> I've stepped on the ground. You're telling me, you know, I got pictures of my phone right here if you want to see. Uh, <laughs> and interestingly enough, look at this on this map. It looks like South America is represented. But Antarctica, well, South America is quite clearly represented, but Antarctica also was not discovered until 1821. It took Captain Kirk sailing in his boat, the Resolution, in the late 1700s. His journals were published in England, and they spoke of seals and whales in great abundance. Back then, the only oil you could get for your oil lamps was whale oil. And so after Cook's um, journals were published, all the seafarers and merchant marines and opportunistics went down to Antarctica, nearly hunted several whale species into extinction, such as the right whale and, and the blue whale. Fortunately, there were some pods that they didn't get. And still to this day, the whale population is depleted from that era. But isn't it interesting that you have maps that depict Antarctica, which was discovered until the whalers got down there in 1821. So here's a map almost 300 years before then showing the Antarctica coast. And with this slide, you can see some of the comparisons to the Caribbean and another talk I give about the early maps and the, the builder race shows all of these uh, parts of the world in greater detail, and you can see the comparisons. But that the whole South America eastern coastline could have been mapped uh, as accurately as it was is pretty amazing. 
And to his dying day, Christopher Columbus never knew he discovered a new continent. To his dying day, he thought he had found the islands off of India. And that's why our Native American people are still called Indians to this day. They were misnamed. And we'll get into a bunch of Native American sites in this talk. <clears throat> so when we consider the early maps, you also have to consider what some of the early pre-Columbus voyages looked like as well. I grew up in Chicago, and I remember reading about this Wabonzi stone. It is the oldest relic of Chicago, quite likely the uh, remnant of Phoenicians. And this is really interesting because what were the Phoenicians doing in the Great Lakes region? Oh, many hundreds of years before Columbus. Well, the Phoenicians were great traders as well as sailors, and they knew the sea routes to America. But just like the age of discovery, holding those maps in very close proximity, the Phoenicians never revealed where they were able to find the copper. Copper back in the age of Homer, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, that was the Bronze Age, because at that point they had smelted copper and tin. Well, the tin mines are well known. They're all over Southern Britain and other places of Europe. But the larger copper has always been quite a mystery. Well, it turns out the largest vein of copper is in the upper peninsula of Michigan, right on the shores of Lake Superior. In fact, you go there today and there's still giant copper mines, a place called Iron Mountain. I mean, it's very rich in all kinds of metals. Uh, and when I went through there, I saw some of the open pit mines that were created in prehistoric times, even some of the tools that were used to carve these out. So where does that uh, fit this guy into the picture? Well, the, sometimes the, the, the stories to just uh, talk a subject away are, are just more ridiculous than the what if it's Venetian. So the, 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 the story that it was built by a soldier at Fort Dearborn, I actually got a chance to see this stone. It's about this high. The face is about that big, about life size. And at the very top is a cavity about this big. And this is important when I tell you what the proposed use was for. But the cavity had a drainage through the mouth, okay? And the lips are pursed, and there happens to be a long goatee beard that Native Americans famously had no facial hair, or very little. So that's one thing that's off. The other thing is this big flat face doesn't even look like a Native American. But after fluid would flow through the cavity, it would come through the mouth, and then there was a drainage catch where the goatee beard is, and then it would presumably flow down into the Chicago River. That's where it was found the oldest relic in Chicago, quite presumably why the city was built where it is. Because Father Marquette and Louis Joliet, the earliest explorers of the whole Mississippi River Valley, were shown by the Native Americans the outlet at a place called Mud Lake. It's in a suburb called Lyons, Illinois. And I did an episode with Scott Walter on America on Earth exactly about this. And this is so crucial because like the early maps, it would show you the way into the river system. So basically the story behind the Wabanzi stone is that this was created by the Phoenicians. You can find these same faces and same artifacts in Carthage region, which is today Tunisia in the uh, Southern Mediterranean region and it was used for child sacrifice. They were pagans back then. They superstitious, believed that a 
successful voyage would be enhanced with a child sacrifice. And that's why the cavity at the top perfectly fits an infant. So I think because of this grisly uh, usage of the Wabanzi stone, so many historians just like to uh, blow it off and say, oh, no, no that's, that's got to be this guy who unknown soldier had all this time on his hands that carved the face of a chieftain named Wabanzi. But there's other relics that are also Phoenician and of a sacrificial nature. It's a location called America Stonehenge. And I was out there on winter solstice about 10 years ago. And it's called America Stonehenge because there are stone alignments, just like Stonehenge in England, but without the, the big triptych stones. But, there, but it is megalithic, as you can see here. Megalithic meaning just large carved stones. And this is the uh, sacrificial altar. And it has drainage for blood. And it had other very telltale signs that it was built by Phoenicians. So it would appear that they would lay over in New England. This isn't too far from the coast but the route would be to go up through St. Lawrence Seaway to um, the uh, Lake Ontario, and there's a Trent Severn waterway. You can even take a yacht there today because you have to go over the Niagara Escarpment. The Niagara Falls goes over 300-foot uh, cliff escarpment that goes from southern Ontario across into uh, upper New York State. And so... If you think in terms of why would they do that? Why would they go all the way, uh, multi-year trip to Lake Superior? Well, as I said, copper was worth more than gold. So if you think, get together a bunch of your hardworking mates, you do that voyage across the ocean, you get all the guys to pull the empty boat up the area of the Trent Severn Waterway, get into Lake Huron, and then you're at the same level as Lake Michigan and just slightly below Lake Superior. You fill up your cargo hold with that copper, then you have to get it back. And that's the hard part. So while you sail across the Great Lakes, you're pretty well protected, but by the time you get to the narrow waterways in Illinois, that's the point where they did their sacrifice. And so when I was on that show with Scott Walter, we also had uh, Robert May, who does Archaeology Digest. And he said on the show as well that there was another Wabanzi stone in northern Florida on the East Coast. So the last stop they would make, they would then hug the coast around Florida, get their last provisions do one more sacrifice, and then basically catch the trade winds across to Europe. And if you were to successfully survive that voyage with a cargo hold of copper, you'd be a millionaire, a multimillionaire in those terms. That was the most valuable alloy at the time. So these uh, megaliths at America Stonehenge some of these megaliths weigh 15 to 20 tons. They're just huge. This is the uh, winter solstice sun shining in one of them. It didn't really make a really good picture to show you the alignments with the sun, but sure enough, they have a viewing tower. Over in the Boston area, I can't recommend going to this site enough because you go to the viewing platform and you can see all the alignments. And it, and it worked perfectly. Sun came right up over a heel stone, much like in the regular Stonehenge. So the ancients had some kind of technology here, technology that uh, is used in the science called archaeoastronomy. And that is finding astronomical alignments, most presumably the solstice, the equinoxes, but also the movement of the sun and moon. 
Well, being a Norwegian and ancestor of the Vikings myself, I couldn't help but uh, pour over the maps of the Indians. And this is the Wineland mapped or Vinland mapped. And this was first discovered by Leif Erikson a little over a thousand years ago. And he was of the Greenland colony. You can see it pretty accurately represented on this map. Uh, they started out coming over from Scandinavia, of course. Iceland was uninhabited until about 1,200 years ago, first inhabited by the migrating Scandinavians. And it was uh, Leif Erikson's father, Eric the Red, who was banished from Iceland for killing a man. And because people were scarce those days and he was a hardworking male and uh, they didn't want to kill him, but they banished him from the island. So he had heard stories that there were lands to the east or to the west. And so he set sail and Eric the Red, Leif Erikson's father, discovered Greenland. And he thought, here's early PR marketing for you. Well, if we name it Greenland, that means a lot of colonists will come over. <laughs> and it's actually quite the opposite. Iceland should be more of the Greenland than Greenland is. But there is a little area just right on the southern tip, the southwestern tip of Greenland. I've actually flown over it coming back from Europe once and saw it. And you, there's grasslands there. You could raise some cattle. But the one thing they don't have are trees. No trees in Greenland. So when Leif Erikson came over, after uh, Eric the Red got banished, discovered Greenland, came back to Iceland and got a bunch of colonists to move with him to Greenland, including his family. And by then there were already reports of some of the sailors getting blown off course and getting to that location called Helluland. And that just means flat rocks, nothing really there of value, but it's basically where um, the Labrador part of Canada is right across from Greenland. So they knew there was lands to the West. And so because there was no wood and without wood, you can't fix or repair or build new boats. Leif Erikson went on a voyage of discovery around the year 1000, first to how you land, no trees, kept going south to Mark land. And that does mean the land of trees. And that's where Nova Scotia is. Scrailing land is, scrailing was their term for Native Americans. That's the St. Lawrence Seaway there. But they kept going down and around in that peninsula that's where Wineland is. That's Vinland. Vinland, including Leaf's Longhouse, is in Massachusetts, a place called Buzzards Bay. And I've gone there, and there's not far away a place called Fall River, Massachusetts, where a full skeleton and armor was discovered. It was such a sensation in the 18, mid-1850s that the poet Longfellow wrote a whole poem about the skeleton in armor, who is presumed to be Leif Erikson's brother. Thorvald Erikson died in Vinland from an air shot from one of the Skrelings and asked to be buried at their colony. That's right by where uh, Buzzards Bay is, just, just above it, Fall River. And you can still go there, see the plaque for the skeleton and armor that was found there. Another map done from the Vikings. They thought, as far as they could tell, that uh, the new continent was really an island. But you can see how accurately, at this point, they had already mapped out Europe. Look, even Sardinia and Corsica, those two islands uh, in the Mediterranean Sea as well as Sicily accurately represented. Some of these other islands are quite a mystery. There's one off of Ireland called High Brazil that kept showing up on all these maps. It wasn't until about 1870 that the Royal 
navy of England finally took high Brazil off the map. So a lot of these islands down there, although some of them are close to the Canary or the Azores, um, never shown to exist. But you could see Greenland there, Iceland, as well as the colonies that they had made in Vinland. And of course, the latitude of the southern part of Vinland there is about where New England is. So another telltale sign <clears throat> that indeed the Vikings did make it as far south as Cape Cod. But they also made it inland, quite a ways inland, including all the way to Minnesota. And uh, my travel companion here, Max, and I went out to uh, this location, the Kensington Runestone, and saw this in uh, northern Minnesota. And this is a record of a Viking exploration. Many centuries later, the Vikings kept coming back. And they say that they took a voyage of discovery from Vinland into presumably Hudson Bay. And from Hudson Bay, there's a river system called the Red River of the North that when if you took that river south, you would get to the Dakotas and northern Minnesota. And that's approximately where this was found. And it talks of the Vikings setting up a little summer camp, presumably hunting and fishing and exploring around this Red River of the North area when they were confronted with an enemy who killed all the people that were watching their boat. And so the, the outward party came back to find all their uh, shipmates killed. And so they ran back to an island. <clears throat> Vikings did this all the time. They would build their little hill fort and their protection on a little island. So they have water as a barrier of protection. And that's where they wrote this runic message saying that uh, what had happened to their other crew, <clears throat> that they were here. And then the telltale sign of all this is right on the very bottom there, AVM. And so instantly when an illiterate farmer discovered this in Minnesota who broke a a shovel trying to get it out with his son and went through so much hardship just showing this to the world. In the end, he just left it as a step to a barn until it was recovered. And the skeptic said that AVM, well, that's Latin. That's not Viking runes, but it's actually the telltale sign that it's genuine because the Scandinavians in the 14th century had just converted to Christianity. They were among the last Europeans to convert. And AVM stands for Ava Maria. So the last lines of the Kensington runestone is AVM, save us from peril. So they're praying to a Christian God. They're stuck on this remote island. And they need to get back to the ship, get it going again with a limited crew, get out of there. But one thing the Vikings would always do is leave a rune stone at the farthest point they ever get to. And there are rune stones way up north above uh, Greenland, and as well as the Haga Sophia, which is a, a big uh, dome, the biggest dome in the world in Turkey, right there in Istanbul. And when the Vikings got there, it was like a Kilroy was here. They're just going to mark it and say, yeah, we made it here. <laughs> we took it and they were great at navigating the rivers. They did all the rivers in uh, Western Russia, all the rivers in Europe. I mean, that, that's why they got such a bad rap because they would just show up and rape and pillage. But when they got Christianized, then they got civilized. They stopped doing that, but they did want to find new pastures, new lands. And that's what these voyages of discovery into the Americas were all about. So here is where, uh, this is where the skeleton and armor, this is the plaque. And it also was uh, 
uh, Lizzie Borden, remember the old nursery rhyme? Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her father 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. That's also in Fall River. <laughs> Funny that that would get more fame than the skeleton in armor did, but uh, here's a little plaque for it. And it was uh, 1831. And it was found by, uh, I think it was her mother or grandmother, Lizzie Borden's uh, ancestor, found it. So spanning across the continent, more skeletons and armor were discovered all the way in Oklahoma, where they happened to have some rune stones as well, saying Kilroy was here. And all these places... I also ascribe to being a sacred place because I feel like if they were there, they had some kind of worship, either pagan or early Christian, that they laid their fellow soldiers and voyage members to rest, including here in Spiro Mound. So when I was working on that Sacred Place North America book, I'm crossing the country four times, pull in here to Spiro Mounds to check out the skeleton armor. And even though it was found there and it's well in the record, talk to the archaeologists on site. Just like, no, nah, no, nah, that's well overblown. There's no evidence it exists. Well, because back then they would break into some of these mound sites. And you know, these mound sites, hundreds of them, hundreds of them across mostly the Midwest, but all the way out to the Great Plains. Uh, in the 1920s or 30s, you could break into them, find artifacts, set up a little roadside for sale, and sell them all. So sadly, over 90% of these mounds were just pillaged, destroyed, or plowed over by the farmer. They were just in the way, get rid of them. We don't care what's under there. Sometimes crushing the artifacts or funerary items that were left. <clears throat> so here again, another large male skeleton wearing a full suit of copper armor with beads and shells and all kind of accoutrement. And boy, we never learned this in school. Wish we did because could have gotten me started a lot earlier. <laughs> well, this is out where I live also uh, in the Midwest and went to this location a couple times. Not only was this a hill fort, with uh, a central temple, very similar in design to what you find in the Mayan cities. A central temple, a plaza, and flanking smaller pyramids on the side. Also Cahokia Mounds in Illinois. You see, they didn't have the stones to work with like the Mayans did, so they had to work with earthen mounds. And not far away from here, is a town called Mill Lake, and it's right on the shore of Rock Lake. And underneath Rock Lake are sunken pyramids. I'm putting together a talk right now called Underwater Archaeology, and maybe if the Oakmont Symposium wants to have me back, I'll give you guys that talk. And it will certainly include Rock Lake with these underwater formations. And I'll tell you, there are dozens of underwater archeological sites around the world. It's quite fascinating. So this one being one of the many of the Mississippian mound sites, another one close to where I grew up. And I remember this as a kid, we'd see this little plaque. My dad was a scuba diver. He liked to go to Devil's Lake. And so anytime you hear the word devil in a name, out here we have Devil's Post Pile, and it, it's, it's always inverted. It's always the opposite. So what they really called the name was Spirit Lake. And they felt that Devil's Lake in Southern Wisconsin um, had spirits in it. My dad would always remark how clear the water is. And on the banks of Devil's Lake are all these effigy mounds. An effigy just means in the shape of a figure or an animal or a spirit figure, in this case, a winged man. And you can still see this uh, mound site on the shores of Devil's Lake in Wisconsin. 
Out in New England is this mystery tower, again, ascribed as just an old, old stone mill, except it's featured on the earliest maps of the mapping of the New England coast. There was an Italian explorer named Verrazzano, who the Verrazzano Bridge in New York is named after, his map shows this tower on it. Well, how could it be that the very first explorers are seeing this stone tower if it was some old stone mill? Well, again, let's, let's look at the other side of it. And this is a tower that stands on the highest hill on Newport Island, this is in the state of Rhode Island. And either built by the uh, Templars under Henry Sinclair in the 14th century or by the Vikings, because there is a very faint Viking rune on it. And this is also pretty close to Fall River, Massachusetts and Leafs, Vinland. Inside this Newport Tower, you can see a fireplace on the second level. And if you were able to make a fire there, there are directional windows. I'll just go back you can see some of those. Well, at least one of them, but they're all the way around. From that level, having a fire in that fireplace, this was a lighthouse. This was a way to, on the highest hill in the port, <clears throat> with a fire in the fireplace, a lookout tower and a lighthouse, helping other mariners find their way into Newport Harbor. And so it really begs the question, who discovered North America? And how could Columbus be the first discoverer of a continent that was already populated by millions of Native Americans? Because they didn't know where they were? <laughs> Columbus didn't know where he was. So I certainly would defer to the Native American people of course discovered it. Now I had a friend named uh, Clifford Mahoudi, he just passed away a few months ago. <clears throat> he was a Zuni elder. He was also on Ancient Aliens and a bunch of these shows. He went so far as to say that the Puebloan Indians who were the Zuni, the Hopi, the Yavapai, there's five Pies, P-A-I at the end of their name, Supapai, <clears throat> that these ancient Puebloan people, and Clifford did not like the A word. He thought it was like the N word. The A word is Anasazi. We should never say that. That was the name that the <clears throat> Navajo gave to the Hopi and the ancestral Puebloan people. And it means ancient enemy. And Clifford was off to say, how could we be the enemy when we were here thousands of years earlier? He went so far as to say that they were descendants of Lemuria, that they were tens of thousands of years old. And when that continent went down, the survivors came here and they were the Puebloan Indians who are still there. And some of the oldest inhabited locations in North America are some of their sites. And boy, were they quite prolific builders. This is out at Chaco Canyon. This is the largest kiva in the world. Kiva, K-I-V-A, simply means a ceremonial center. Almost always round, which is interesting because it shows the shape of the planets, rotation of the earth, shape of the earth. And again, these windows serve as archaeoastronomy sighting. So you could be in this kiva, which was covered, there was a roof on it. But when the light came through, especially on those very key important days of solstice and equinox, it would light up portions of this kiva. And those were the key days of their ceremony. This one could hold hundreds of people in a single ceremony. And of course, uh, the special day was summer solstice when the sun came right through. And there's also a mesa in Chaco Canyon 
has these petroglyphs that only get lit up on the summer solstice. So they clearly knew these dates. And then when you look at the uh, ruins here, and actually uh, Clifford's corrected me, the ancient ones, you could say that, but he still doesn't like the term. He said it meant ancient enemies in Navajo. Um, well, we should still avoid the A word. But here you can see how exquisite their craftsmanship was creating many of these ruins. And this is one of the um, great houses that connected to Chaco Canyon. So Chaco Canyon was the hub with all these roads extending out from it. Another site, if you ever get to New Mexico, go to Chaco Canyon, it's uh, quite a place. And some of these roads still exist. And just like the Roman roads, straight as an arrow, they would just go up over mesas. You can see the stairs uh, in Chaco Canyon leading out to these great roads that led to these great houses. So this was a very advanced civilization that just went poof, we're gone about 800 years ago. So by the time the Spanish got there, they were already gone. They were already in ruin and nobody was living in them anymore. One of the great mysteries of North America is what happened to this high civilization. Now, what Clifford would say is, well, we never went, we never went away. We just moved to other places that had water. So there was a period in North America about 800 years ago where there was a, a very intense drought. And so maybe these locations were overpopulated and they had to move further afield or back towards water sources. Another telltale sign of their connection with Central American high cultures are the ball courts. And yes, we have dozens of ball courts in Arizona and New Mexico. This was the ancient game played by the Mayans, similar to the sport of soccer. You could use your legs, you could kick it, you could use your head, but you couldn't throw it. And what you're trying to do is get the ball into those slits in the ball court. So it's funny how these, uh, all these sports kind of go through the centuries and people would sit on the rim of these um, ball courts and cheer on their home team and the visiting team would come in and it would be a, a big celebration. Down in Central America, it had a more grisly ending where not the winning team, or I mean, not the losing team, but the winning team would be executed. It was that high of an honor. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> where do I sign up? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's not going to end well if you win. <laughs> but they felt that that was okay because they were moving to a better place and they were serving their gods and deities. And the other really interesting thing about the Southwest are all these pictographs. Now, the difference between a pictograph and a petroglyph is the pictographs are painted where the petroglyphs are chiseled out of the rock. And you can see the uh, comparison to a friend there who took the picture with me, how big these are. And these are clearly giants on the left, seven, eight, nine feet tall, wearing these big robes and big bulbous eyes. And I know my friends at Ancient Aliens have uh, come to a conclusion who they really are <laughs> or represent. But it's really interesting in this location, this Sago Canyon, there's a cliff face, kind of a, a half moon with these figures on it, and then a ceremonial area right below. So where he's standing could have been the grandstands and the ancient ones are there witnessing the event as well. Some of these figures are holding snakes in their hands, or snakes represented going down their robes. They all have these big bulbous eyes and long robes on. So another great mystery what these figures represented. 
And so also, some of these same figures can be found in Ontario, Canada, all the way up at Peterborough. And in Peterborough, they have the Canadian version of a serpent mound, same to that serpent mound located in Ohio. There's another one in Canada. But what's interesting here is some of these carvings, especially the ones with the, the one eye, those are old Viking carvings. And then you have what look like some of the robed figures there and some exotic animals. And there's also a coca figure playing the flute, which you find also throughout the Southwest. So this was kind of like a billboard. This is another Kilroy was here. If you make it to here, you're going to want to put your uh, stamp on it. And by the way, this is right next to the Trent Severn waterway. So some of these could be Phoenician as well. But it looks like it's an amalgamation of all the different cultures and people who traveled across North America trading. You know, they have found uh, seashells from the Gulf of Mexico in some of the tombs in the Midwest, as well as feathers from toucan birds, which only could have lived down in Central America, all up through the Southwest. So there had been once a very robust trading network, including obsidian rock, which was the main rock that was used for uh, spear points. And that obsidian largely comes out of Wyoming, a quarry near Yellowstone, and it's been found literally across the country, showing a very robust trading network. So it's not too far out of the imagination of putting people from the Southwest or uh, elsewhere in North America here at this location. So traveling around the uh, Great Lakes, this wouldn't be too far from where they were getting the copper. Lake Superior, by the way, is just gorgeous. Deepest of the Great Lakes, and they believe they have kind of their own Loch Ness monster living in there. And there he is. And it was a good monster. <laughs> it, would, it would escort a group of Indians across the lake and keep them alive in the stormy water. So they, they didn't fear it too much. But you could also see below this sea monster called Mishapishu, uh, there are also serpents, those snakes that live in the water as well. So a, a very rich mythology of different creatures all over the place. Off of uh, Lake Huron is the Dreamer's Rock. This is carved smooth by white quartzite from uh, the glacial activity. And here's one of the best sites to go to to see where Native Americans went on their vision quest. And basically what that meant was <clears throat> when a child was reaching puberty, clearly about to become an adult, they still had a child name and they were all male and female alike, basically banished from the tribe for about a week to fend for themselves. And they would take them to some of these vision quest sites, drop them off by canoe, say, have at it, kid. We'll come back in a week to get you. And they would obviously fast or get whatever kind of food they could have. <clears throat> this being right off the coast of Lake Huron. So they could drink water. You won't die for up to two months if you can just drink water. Uh, you'll die in 48 hours without food or water. So they'll make it through, but the whole idea was to get the adolescents into almost a dreamlike or psychedelic state where through fasting and through chanting and other religious artifacts they might have, they were all instructed to wait for an animal spirit to come to them. It could be in the form of a hawk flying over, a bear walking by, or snake in the water. And so whatever it was that they saw, 
they would take back to the tribal members and the tribal members would have a big ceremony for the child and then give them their adult name. And so these vision quests were very much a rite of passage for Native Americans across the whole country. I kind of think we should do that with our kids these days. It might teach them some good lessons, maybe. <laughs> how, how good they have it, right? <laughs> and to come back, you get, get your new adult name and take it from there. Uh, and so many of these credible sites across North America, I can't tell you, and I'm sure you all know, what an amazing continent this is. <laughs> There's so many places to see and, and do. And uh, this is in the San Luis Valley. And right beyond these sand dunes in Colorado was the very first animal mutilation. You might have heard of the cattle mutilations. That occurs quite a bit in the San Luis Valley. But the very first animal was a horse named Snippy the Horse. First mutilated in 1964 in the shadow of these great sand dunes, which is interesting because this was such an important sacred place. Mount Blanca was one of the four mountains of the Navajo. This is the northern mountain. Um, and the dunes themselves, they just rise out of nowhere. We have a really interesting great sand dunes in the middle of Nevada. If you're ever driving across Highway 50, out of nowhere, boom, 30 story tall sand dunes. These ones are even bigger and more vast. What I really liked about these great sand dunes is there's little oases. There's little pockets of spring water that comes out. So this, again, would have been used for vision quest. If you're thirsty, go to the spring, wait until your animal guide comes. And oftentimes those animal guides would lead these children to food sources. All the more reason why they felt that there was a spiritual connection. As well as Black Butte. This is just outside of the, uh, the mountains in South Dakota. And this is a pilgrimage site, also a vision quest site. Uh, you can hike up to the top of it near the Black Hills of South Dakota. Many offerings along the way, including these prayer flags and other votive items that were left. It's also where they do the Sturgis motorcycle race. <laughs> That's like motorcycle people, their pilgrimage place. Guess we can all use a pilgrimage place. <laughs> and uh, But this is a very sacred site. You can just tell from the minute you start walking on the trail how important this location is to the many Plains Indians who have worshipped this site for thousands of years. Here's another name of uh, a sacred mountain that was misascribed to the devil. Uh, Devil's Tower, you might remember it from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and actually based on a true story that uh, took place in Nevada at Area 51, the Project Serpo. Uh, another talk for another day. But isn't it interesting that here's a very sacred native site given the name Devil and then used in this modern era to represent something extraterrestrial that reached the mainstream. You see, none of this happens by accident. Spielberg, given the information about close encounters, what would it be like if we had our first meeting with highly advanced extraterrestrials? These things don't happen by accident. They didn't choose this site for no reason. That's what I'm trying to say. Closer to here, in Pyramid Lake is this very famous profile of an Indian mother with a basket. This is Pyramid Lake. It's uh, the only outflow of Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe has 71 feeder streams, but only one river out. And all rivers in Nevada flow into the Great Basin. The Great Basin is a very unique geological formation. It is 
no outlets of water. So every river finds a lake that seasonally goes up and down. During the last ice age, this had been a big inland sea called Lake Lahotian and sprinkled all around this part of Northern Nevada, they found mummified giants with red hair. You guys think I'm tall. Some of these mummies were over seven feet, eight feet tall, mummified and put in these caves right on the shores of Lake Lahotian. Now these rock formations you see are travertine. This is a type of rock that is formed when hot water coming out from geothermal activities has a large mineral content. And then that mineral content, when exposed to colder temperatures and colder water, will start to form these tufa formations. So if any are familiar with Mono Lake and some of those weird formations, this is all called travertine rock. And I was just out at Travertine Hot Springs a couple of months ago, and a geologist told me that. And I'm kind of one of those people that always ask questions on things I don't know. And here you go. You see, I'm passing information on to you guys. So all of these rock formations, including the pyramid in Pyramid Lake, which is very four-sided pyramidal, I swam out to it once after Burning Man. We used to go camping here. And there's still a hot spring there. You, you, you go up, and the water's kind of the temperature of a cool Olympic pool, and then all of a sudden, wow, it's getting warmer. And so a uh, ranger once told me, yeah, if the lake level is just right, you can swim out there and take a hot, hot spring right there on sacred pyramid of Pyramid Lake. So moving on, another archaeoastronomy site, Bighorn Medicine Wheel, and this is on June 21st looking at the alignment. So there are these, uh, they call them spirit houses. There's six of these round carns around a central hub connecting to the middle where the sun's coming right on up. Perfect alignment. That's not a coincidence. They were built this way by the Plains Indians. Most of these medicine wheels are actually up in Canada in Alberta and Saskatchewan, but we have a few in North America, and this one's probably the best preserved, uh, way up high on Medicine Mountain. Interesting name that. And it too has all sorts of votive offerings around it. And <clears throat> as I've traveled around to many of these sacred places, in Peru, they have the Intihuana stone and many of the Mayan sites, including at Chichen Itza, the pyramid. There's a serpent that lights up from the sun only on the equinox. So many of the sites have these archaeoastronomy uh, alignments for a very important reason. And that is, if you were the shaman of your tribe and it was your job to either tell the farmers when to put their seeds in, not too early, not too late, depending on when the rains are gonna come. Or if you're way up in Northern Wyoming for the summer hunting, you're gonna need to know when the seasons start to turn. And when the leaves start changing, it might be too late. You may have only another week or two until the big storms get you trapped up there. So knowing the movement of the seasons was hugely important. And I can tell you, you can find this evidence around the world, but most especially in Mesoamerican cultures. They had to know this information. It was vitally important for the survival of their people to know this. And so they built these monuments as a standing uh, monument to time so they could tell time. Well, there was a prophecy of the white buffalo. And when the white buffalo emerged, peace would engulf all people of all races. And this white buffalo was born uh, about 25 years ago. Not sure if it's still alive. I hope so. They probably kept it. And 
let's hope that prophecy comes true. <clears throat> so when you travel across the Great Plains, these teepees were actually uh, very transient. The Spanish brought the horses here. Native Americans never had horses. But when they got the horses, they learned to ride them like no other and became some of the greatest horse riders in history in just a very short period of time, only a few hundred years. And we're right up there with the Mongols as being the best horsemen ever. And you might ask yourself, why? Why were the Native Americans so good at that? Well, they had a very close relationship with all the living animals and species. Almost to the point where some of the early settlers thought that they could communicate with animals, Dr. Doolittle. And because they really valued the animal, and when they would kill a buffalo, they would use every single part of it. Nothing went to waste. And every time they would kill an animal, they would pray over it and thank that animal for giving its life. And there's even some evidence that in times of great famine, when the Indians were really weak, and you see before horses, they had to disguise themselves in a buffalo hide and just try to slowly make their way up close enough to be able to shoot a bow and arrow. But oftentimes the buffalo would get wind of it. And once they started stampeding, you're not going to catch them. But there are many signs that say in stories that the Native Americans passed down that when they were in a famine and it was do or die, that they needed a kill, that somehow that they would have a connection with the animal and one animal that maybe was sickly or elderly wouldn't even run. It would just sacrifice itself to save the tribe. So they had this kind of connection with animals that I think we've kind of lost. But I think a lot of you, if you have your own pets, you find that there is a kind of telepathic communication that you share with these animals. They're not so different from us. And when they're cold or scared or hungry, you know it, they'll tell you. Just like wild animals will do that too. So then with the advent of the first settlers in North America came Guns, Germs, and Steel. You guys have ever heard of that book? Great book. Jared Diamonds, the author. And Guns, Germs, and Steel is basically how these tiny little countries in Europe were able to colonize the whole planet. Guns, clearly a weapon that was superior to any hand-to-hand -hand armor combat. Germs killed more Native Americans than anything. Smallpox and many other diseases went rampant across the Great Plains. In fact, when De Soto, the Spaniard, came up in 1540 and did his tour and saw the very first of the uh, Mound cities, the first ones he got to were hugely populated. Cahokia Mounds, just across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, had a larger population than London a thousand years ago. And when DeSoto got there, they unwittingly released smallpox and other diseases upon the Native American people. And by the time they got up to some of the other mound cities, the smallpox beat them there. And all they found was death and destruction. So guns, germs, and the use of steel, which was the main building implement for the ships, for the tools, for the weapons, is how the Europeans won dominion over the world. Because if you think about it, if you were in a, a British pub just before the age of discovery, this tiny little town, and somebody would come into that pub and say, your English language is going to be the language of the world someday. You think, how the heck could that ever be possible? Well, the Brits were the great explorers. The old, old saying was, the sun never sets on the British Empire because they had so many far-flung colonies. That is how they did it, with the aid of guns, germs, and steel. 
So then you have the new kind of sacred places that come to North America, uh, pilgrimage sites and monasteries. And they're beautiful places to visit. I'm not knocking it in any way. I'm just saying it's a new way of looking at the landscape and to put in the European style of worship. So then the Christian, Catholic, uh, churches and monasteries, much in the same manner operating as they did in medieval Europe, and even with the Mormon church. The American version of a Christian religion developed by the Mormons, followed by 11 million worldwide. You go to downtown Salt Lake City, and the temple is very prominent. All the grid lines for the whole Salt Lake City area is based on downtown Salt Lake. And so I also loved going, every time I go back to uh, New England, if I have time to travel around, I try to find some more of these, uh, these stone chambers. This one in Upton, one of the best, finally recognized as a city park. And it's used with uh, dry masonry and then capped off with a megalithic capstone. And this one and many others have astronomical alignments. This one is winter sol excuse me, winter solstice, and it shines right into the chamber. And then across the way, there's a hill where there was an old stone carn that would have acted like it did in uh, America Stonehenge, New Hampshire, to mark that setting. Here's a picture of Lovelock Cave. This is where some of those mummified giants were found. It's not a very hard drive from the town of Lovelock, I think only about 15 miles away. And they'll even tell you on that uh, sign right there that uh, these mummified giants were found. So I've gone to the Lovelock Museum, the Winnemucca Museum, and a few others in Nevada in search of these giants. And they kind of laughed me out the door. Said, One of you guys again, huh? <laughs> but they have found size 18 foot sandals. And they have found duck decoys and other artifacts that are so unique to these mummified giants that were found in these caves. And there's several of them. There's another one called Spirit Cave and a couple that are kind of off the radar. They don't want you going to, but I'm going to try to find them I'm my way out moving to uh, Nevada. So they won't be far away. I'm, and I'll live where this Lake Lahotian uh, lake bed is located. And so these caves would have been located right on the shores of this giant freshwater lake that uh, existed during the last ice age. And here's some of those giants. Yeah, this one is actually found in uh, San Diego. And they found hundreds of them in the Channel Islands, those islands in Southern California. Big boys like this. Look, he's about an eight footer. You guys think I'm tall? That's higher than I can reach. That's how big they were, eight foot four. And they were found all across the Ohio River Valley as well. So is that it? That's it. <laughs> and I know I'm about out of time. So thank you guys so very much. Super. We have a few minutes left for some question and answer. And then Brad will be in the back to um to answer any other questions, and his books are also in the back. Um, do we have any questions for Brad? Okay, right here. Well, you absolutely exude an infectious spirituality. Oh, thank you. And I'm wondering, do you ever consider hosting or guiding <laughs> trips? I mean, I would sign up today. Would you now? Well, 
Funny you should ask that. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm, I'm doing a uh, cruise to Mexico in April. And you can go to my website, bradolson.com. And it's the mystery cruise. I'm one of the speakers. And they have some ancient alien guys. And Scott Walter from uh, America on Earth is going to be on it, too. So to answer your question, yes. Uh, am I the... Uh, in Japan, I, I lived in Japan for 14 months as an English teacher. And I always remember the tour guide would be the one holding up a little flag and kind of leading everybody and da -da 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 -da, describing a place. Uh, haven't gotten to that point yet, but maybe I'm considering it. But uh, the cruise is going to start things off and see how that goes. We're going to go ashore in several locations and check out places. Yeah. Brad, I have a question for you over here. Yeah. So these giants, are they thought to be pure human? Are they thought to be alien? That's or... a great question. Let's see if I can go back to that big guy. I have to go through all the... Um, alien, that, that's, that's a tough one. If anything, you could say maybe they're a hybrid. So, and I do do a talk on the giants. And some of them... And I've actually seen them in a museum in South America have these elongated skulls. So they have 30% larger cranial capacity than humans do. So their heads are 30 to 35% bigger. Presumably their bodies are going to be bigger. These are the giants. And the thing about these elongated skulls is, for one, they don't have the uh, central suture that we do. Their eye sockets are also 30% bigger. The area where their spine meets their brain is 30% bigger. So they're very human-like, but they're not human. But interestingly, a lot of them have red hair for some reason and presumably multicolored eyes. So my colleague, Brian Forrester, has finally uh, secured a DNA test and he found that they have a mother's mitochondrial DNA that's human, and oftentimes a father of unknown DNA origin. So to answer your question, hybrid human something is the most logical conclusion. How old? Thousands of years old. Some are so old, they found them in old mines, and they would try to lift up a bone, they just turned to dust. And the older they are, the bigger they are, and double row of teeth and an extra digit, sometimes six fingers, six toes. So human-like, but not quite human. Now, people who read the Bible have told me that they're the Anunnaki, that this is this race from the Old Testament that are actually the cedar race, that they were the ones who came here and did a little genetic tinkering, created the humans. We're kind of a worker race to them. So I think the jury's still out on exactly who and what these tall giants were, but we had quite a, quite a few of them located here in North America. Do we have more questions? Brad, I have one. What's going on with uh, climate change and the ruins that you um, have gone to? Are you seeing any significant changes? <clears throat> Well, I'll tell you, I went down to Antarctica about four years ago on a sailboat. I, I had the great opportunity of checking it out. I've been to all seven continents in the world. And the northern peninsula of Almer Peninsula, it's kind of like southern tip of South America, northern tip of Antarctica. If you can kind of picture that long peninsula, it's called the Palmer Peninsula. That particular region is going through massive uh, climate change. There, there is melting all over the place. But I start my talk about Antarctica with a map that shows other regions of Antarctica that are actually cooling, where the ice is increasing. So Mother Nature, in her infinite wisdom, finds this balance. Because if Antarctica were to melt, it's the largest freshwater ice in the world, it would be like putting a bunch of ice in this glass and then you'd have it overflow, but it hasn't happened yet. I'm right now living in Santa Cruz and the boardwalk is the same boardwalk as it's been for over a hundred years. So 
let's hope that Mother Nature knows this balance and keeps us there. Yep. Actually, hold on. Uh, I forget his name now, but the um, please speak into the mic. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, the other explorer that goes and Close he there. has the electric trucks, and he wants to go to to uh, South America or to Antarctica. Can't think of his name right now. Uh, oh, he's a he's a, an associate of yours, and he's been to, he's tried to make an exploration down there and got they got stuck and had to, he wants to go back down again. Oh boy! Why From ancient you... aliens, one of those guys. Uh, well, no, he's a uh, explorer. What, is, what and... is your question? My question was: Were you going to try to coordinate a trip with him to go down there? Because he wants to go as well. He's he's been trying to go back a few different times. The okay. unknown person. Well, if I knew who it was, yeah, maybe... if I can think of it before I leave. Okay, all right. Sorry, I couldn't reference. David Hatcher better. Childress, no, Giorgio um, Sikolos. He's guys. an inventor. Uh, I can't think oh. of his name right now. I drew a blank. Well, sorry. Well, I would go back to Antarctica. I just wouldn't want to pay for it. It's quite expensive. Yeah. I, I, actually, pre-COVID, I had just come back and gave my Antarctica talk at uh, Contact in the Desert. Some guy came up and says, hey, man, I work with Hollywood people. We can put together a film crew and we'll go down there. And so I was proposing to go to the new Schwabenland right. area where the uh, Nazis laid claim pre-World War II. And still quite a few mysteries. And the hole. That'll be a good one. And the hole. Yeah. You've you been can... close. I have. So and... it's, it's time to end. All right. Thank you guys so much Thank for coming out. Thank you so much, Brad. Very interesting. Really appreciate y'all coming out. Brad will be in the back and we'll see you next week. And please turn your phones back on. <laughs>